Okay. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to have uh, this place to come to and to worship you and to study your word. And Lord, uh, as a new church, we just trust that you're going to bring people in who you want, uh, according to your will, according to your timing. We need people who are hungry for your word, desire your word, and, and want to learn more, dive deeper. And that's what we aim to do, God. And uh, this morning as we get into today's lesson, it's particularly poignant considering uh, what's coming up within the next couple of days with uh, Yom Turua, East of Trumpets, and what that means, and the, and the differences between that and Rosh Hashanah, which really is a, that's a different thing. And God, we want to learn um, about your feast days and, and what you have foreshadowed in the Old Testament and the typology and how that works. We've been talking a lot about hermeneutics and and uh, the correct way to read scripture to understand it. And so, Lord, we pray that you would wake us up, get us alert, and help us to think this through, this thing through and to figure it out, God, and to uh, see what your word says and to have a uh, discussion about a very difficult. And uh, Lord, may you be blessed by what you what you are doing here today among us, the morning service, and Kevin teaching us in First John, the singing, scripture reading, all this, Lord, we lift up before you. And uh, we just trust, Lord, that you are going to use each of us, each other's lives as we go forward. In Christ's name. All right, so. We're, we've been talking about prophecy, and we were we began this survey, this Old Testament survey, to see if we, I'm sure it will, uh, if we go through passages in the Old Testament, if it brings us to a premillennial position, if it brings us to understanding rapture and all these things, or if it brings us to Nothing but a bunch of uh, figurative language that means nothing because it was all wrapped up in the first century and that kind of stuff. So which way do we end up landing? So if you will, and I will if I find my body, um, before we leave the Pentateuch, we were in the Pentateuch the last couple of weeks, and we actually hopped out to Isaiah and so forth. Um, but, but turn real quick, I want to show you what we're going to look at today this way. You see this chart that we handed out the, uh, about the feast days. Take a look at that. This is from a couple passages in the Old Testament, but we're going to look at Leviticus 23. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Leviticus 23. Feast of the Lord, but I want to point out here too. A lot of times when we take, take a look at these, it's kind of like when you start talking about the end times of the rapture, people freak out and they start holding their fingers up like this. Don't talk about that stuff because people make false prophecies and they say the Lord's coming on October 10th in 1996 or whatever it was. I don't remember the year. So people freak out and they run erroneously in the wrong direction is who will talk about it at all. Well, this is in the Old Testament, the Lord's feast days, and people tend to look at it like these are Jewish holidays. What do Jewish holidays have to do with us in the church? God's done with Israel, right? It has nothing to do with the church now. Jesus came, fulfilled all that, we're done. Let's not even talk about it. And actually, none of that's true. What we find here in Leviticus 23 is these are the Lord's days, not Jewish feast days. These are the Lord, and we'll see the language in here I want you to see where he says, these are these are mine. These are mine, and you're going to keep them forever. So he's not saying these are you, these are yours, do with them what you want. These are the Lord's feast days. And I believe we'll see that there's a reason why feast days are uh, the way they are. And as we've been seeing and we've discussed, there's so much typology that starts happening in the Old Testament, and it's all about who? Yeah, 
everything points to Messiah, right? Everything is pointing to Messiah, so it's all a foreshadowing of Messiah. So we see typologies going back and forth. And um, so let's take a look at this. This is the Lord beginning in Leviticus 23. Let's just read through and then we'll remark on them. And you will see they, they follow the order and the pattern that's on your chart. So beginning in verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath, solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall, do, you shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in your dwelling places. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In verse 5, in the first month, the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any work. I think he's trying to tell them it's a holy convocation and don't do any work. You have Passover that begins on the 15th, and then on the 15th begins unleavened bread. Right, so what we see here with the high holy days is that it is, it is another Sabbath. And depending on, he says to do it on the 15th um, of every month, just like here in the West with our Gregorian calendars. It's the 15th always on the same day every year. Christmas always on the same day every year. It's not. So uh, you will notice here too, would hope. If we look at Passover and you look at the time Christ died. Um, a lot of the confusion about what year did Christ die and all this comes from a misunderstanding of some of this because the Gospels, it describes how it was the day before the Passover. So people were thinking, oh, so we know the Jews, they had their Passover. That's on Saturday, right? That's always on Saturday. So Jesus died on a Friday. No, what they missed, if they studied the Old Testament thoroughly and they studied the culture, they knew their hermeneutics, they would find out that what God is assigning here is a different Passover from the weekly Passover. There's a couple times in the year when you've got, you can have a Passover twice in one week. Such is the case with the, with the Passover during the year when Jesus died. Um, so, it, because it was Pentecost week, and leavened bread. It can happen on a Friday. I mean, a lot of times it did, not the year that Jesus died. Otherwise, he wouldn't be in the grave three days and three. That solves that little conundrum that people have grappled with and mathematicians and so forth over the centuries. They didn't comprehend that. Two, two Passovers, or two Passovers, two Sabbaths, two high holy Sabbaths during during that week. So let's let's continue now. When I will get wrapped up in that, that's an interesting another story. But Beginning in, in verse 9, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits for harvest to the priest, and he shall weigh the sheaf before the Lord so that he may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. On, that, on the day when you shall wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord, and the grain offering with it, by two-tenths of an ephah, of fine flour, mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord, with the aroma, and the drink offering with it, to be of wine, a fourth of a hen. So notice there's two offerings, two different types of harvest offerings. One's like a grain offering, and the other is a drink offering. So you've got the wheat and the grain and so forth, and you also have the grapes. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until the same day. And you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever, throughout your generations, in all your dwellings. So throughout your generations, not until Messiah comes. It's forever. Uh, and then, so we've got within the period of, of one month, and within about 10 days here, 
you've got three feast days. And if you look at your chart, you see the first one, and, and it says it right in here. I mean, it, it's scroll right underneath. Those are the spring feast days, or some people call them holidays, the spring feast days. So we've got the Passover, which we know Jesus is called the Passover lamb, right? We we have that, and we can look at it. Um, if you want First Corinthians um, chapter 5, um, we could turn there real quick. It's well worth looking. First Corinthians chapter 5. The, no, maybe it's, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, verse 7, plans out the old leaven. What does leaven mean? Yes, sir. Sin. It comes out clearly in the, old, in the New Testament, more so than the Old Testament. That you may be new lump, as you really are leaven. Why? Because Christ took care of the sin himself, right? For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been crucified. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. But the, here is just one of several examples that will declare Christ as our Passover lamb. We'll see some of that also in indications of some of these two that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. So we have unleavened bread, and that was Christ. Christ is the unleavened bread. He's without sin. And when he died and was buried, he took our sin with him to the grave. It's buried, it's gone, it's done. It's washed away by the blood of the Lamb. First fruits, he is, Jesus is our first fruits. We read this in 1 Corinthians 15, for example, that he is the first fruits among the dead. And then, um, after 50 days, we had the Feast of Weeks, and that's when uh, we have the, it's still considered a spring holiday, getting into summer. That's when we have the fourth feast day, and um, Christ by this time had ascended, but this is the last thing he did, is he gave us the Holy Spirit and established his church. He said, I will build my church, and it was established at that time. So, Verse 15, looking back at Leviticus 23, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of a new grain to the Lord, and you shall bring this dwelling places to bowls of bread, etc. And then if you see, if you look down at verse 21, you shall make a holy proclamation on the same day, you shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever, again, in all your dwelling places throughout your lands. Then there's there's nothing. Notice this break in the chart. Because Jesus had ascended. The rest of these trumpets, we're going to look at right now, uh, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. So you've got um, Yom Teruah. Yom just means the day. Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and then Shavuot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, so if I've got that right, I don't apologize because my Hebrew is not much better than my English. In fact, not at all. So, Feast of Trumpets. And the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 23, 23, 23, Leviticus. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. You shall present a food offering to the Lord. And then he goes into uh, another Sabbath, or 10 days after that, for the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. That celebrates their wandering in the wilderness and how the Lord was with them. And that's on the 15th day of the seventh month. Seventh month, seventh month. That's all Tishri, the month of Tishri. Spring feasts were in Nisan, at the auto maker. And the fall feasts are in Tishri. Now, here's what's happened. And I'm going to explain to you what happens and why we're looking at all this, because right now it's like, so what? This is. Big deal, my head's swimming now. What does this have to do with Christ and things that are going on? And we'll look at some of these verses, but I wanted to kind of lay the groundwork here and look at foreshadowing that Christ did. And 
this is what I want to establish. Just as Jesus Messiah is the fulfillment of the first spring feast days, he will too, at his second coming or at his return, be the fulfillment of the final three. And he, notice he does this in order. Now, if you look at some of your Bibles, I think even MacArthur's study Bible, which um, he didn't necessarily do those notes, but they're, they're in your MacArthur study Bible. But if the publisher has them in there, um, they'll try to say, well, tabernacles, that's God with us, so that Jesus went to earth and he was born as a baby. That kind of stuff. Well, those are all out of order. Yes, that's true. He did that. But in the big picture, Christ, Messiah, our Messiah blatantly and overtly fulfilled the feast days during the spring. In the fall, he'll also fulfill those. So trumpets. What what happens during trumpets? In the Feast of Trumpets, let me tell you what that looks like. Let me explain what that looks like. And, and some of you already know this, but we come up on the fall. And this is the only feast day that happens on a new moon. Every other feast day, all these others are on a full moon. So they're looking and they're watching, wait, waiting. That's how we know it's the 15th. When um, Passover and then Love of Bread happens, it's, the moon is full. Then you get to this one. And what the Lord's command is here and in numbers places is at the beginning, at the new moon. Now, the way we learn it in the Western world is a new moon is when you can't see it at all. It's just black. In Hebrew custom, that is not a new moon. New moon is when it first appears, the first glimmer, the first twinkling of the new moon that you see. It's a little sliver of a new moon. And that's when you're supposed to say, okay, we're official. Now, Tishri 1, when it starts. Oh, it's Fascinating is that an idiom that happens with Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, and they have a holy convocation and they blow the trumpets, it's at when Tishri 1 starts. It's the beginning of this new holy convocation. And it is known because it's at the new moon as the feast that no man knows. No man knows the day or the hour. So it's celebrated over a two-day period. Because here's what happens is, is you've got the solstice and you've got the equinox, vernal and autumnal equinox, and you've got the solstice, the summer and the winter solstice. And it has to do with the position of where the sun is and the earth are in relation to one another and the equator. The autumnal equinox is where you have that line crossing to where the sun is in relation to the equator. And so what happens is an interesting thing because we know, duh, but just as the earth goes around the sun, the moon goes around the earth. When well, we reach a point here where the moon makes a brief showing in Tishri 1. So you might remember, you notice those days that happen early in autumn where you've got the horizon, the sun setting, and it's beautiful out, the weather's changing, you can feel the air starting to get crisp, especially overnight. And then uh, the moon might come up and make a brief showing, and then it dips back down. So they're looking, got two witnesses. Now looking to announce holy convocation. They're up at the highest point, sometimes up on top of a mountain, and they're looking for that new moon. Problem is the sun is there too. Odds are excellent that they won't even see the moon. So that means the Holy Convocation starts the next day. If they see the moon that first day, it starts. They'll kick it off. Two witnesses will run down. It'll be certified, codified by the, the priests, the rabbis, whatever. Next morning, they're blowing the trumpets and everything. It's official. It started. So that's why it's the feast that no man knows the day or the hour. Might not be one day, but it might be, but it will be the next. So. Jesus concerning his coming, his return, when, the, when his disciples asked him, he says, no man knows. He says, no man knows the day or the hour. He's kept dropping these hints. And you'll notice, and you read those in the, in the Gospels, read it in Matthew, that 
The disciples aren't going, it doesn't say anything about them being confused. They knew what the Lord was talking about. They were like, ah, okay. So, all right, so Yom Teruah when went back. Well, that's short. That's only six months. Cool. But he didn't know what year. And we still today don't know what year. But all these hints here too, it's the strong opinion of many theologians that at the return of Christ, all these things, these fulfillments begin to be kicked off during the fall feast days. And so we can know the season, but we don't know what year. We don't know the day or the hour. Exactly when. We don't even know exactly which day because it could be one day or the other if it happens on Yom Teruah. So before we get into anything else, this is why right now we've got high watch happening among many Christians all over the world who know to watch for these. At the same time, while we're doing this, guess what Israel's doing? They're watching for the Messiah too. And they're at the, the Western Wall right now, and you'll see them praying, doing this, and they're doing prayers of repentance. We're entering into 10 days of awe. And that starts on, we don't know for sure, either the second or the third probably the 3rd of October this upcoming week. So they're going to be, they're getting ready for this now. They're pre, they're praying. They're there at midnight every evening uh, this week. And um, they're going to begin called the 10 day, what's called the 10 days of awe. And it's a time of repentance. It's a time of excitement and anticipation because they're also anticipating and praying for their Messiah to come. Ironically, Messiah probably will, and what does it say in, in John 14, John 14, 1, for instance, that where I am, you're going to be also. Where is he right now? He's up in glory with the Father. What does it say in, um, turn to, let's, let's go there, First Thessalonians. So you know, First Thessalonians, we'll look at First Corinthians 15 too, but First Thessalonians was written about, uh, I think about four years before First Corinthians, even though they're different directions in the book, they're ordered in a different way. Pages are still sticking together in this book. Uh, let's look at chapter four. So there's a lot of confusion here. Paul, as usual, is trying to clear up some confusion that's come to his ears. And that's why he ends up writing a lot of letters. And sometimes it's because there's a lot of sin going on and so forth. And in this particular case, this isn't necessarily directly what he's addressing here, although there are some who have been spreading the rumor that hey, you guys missed the boat. The Lord came and he went. I don't know why they think that. Maybe because they they knew and it was the mindset at the time, the Jew mindset, and were spreading the word around. And when he said he's going to come back at, at you know at the time of that of Yom Teruah, at a time when uh, no one knows the day or the hour. And Yom Teruah, several have gone by now, and he's not here. You guys have missed the boat. So people are starting this thing. We missed it. We missed the whole shebang. And so they're starting these rumors. So Paul's addressing this, but I don't, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, because there was a concern about those who had died. Um, you know, they're stuck now. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you a word from the Lord, that we who are alive are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, they get to go first. Right, and this is what he says, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so that we will always meet the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, that phrase, they're caught up. That's where we get the phrase harpazo. So we're going to be harpazo, caught up with the Lord in the air. This is 
what the verse says. The people who deny the rapture kind of have issues with that, and they'll try to move it around and so forth, get their theology way, and whatever construct. But in the context here, he's talking about how um, we're down here, the Lord in the air, and we are caught up and we meet him in the air. So this is before a return. This is prior to uh, a second coming where, as in the Old Testament, it describes he comes down and when he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, it splits in two and all this. He's not coming down to us and, and setting his foot on the ground and here to stay. Then what we have is we meeting him in the air. So the word hapazo, caught up, is in, in the Latin Bible, it's where we get the word rapture. That's where the rapture comes from. That's not where the word, that's not where the doctrine of the rapture comes from. That's just where the word rapture comes from. That's it uh, right here in this passage. Now, um, just to put a nice, neat little bow on some of this, because Paul's answering similarly. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. We have, we may as well look at this since we're here. Um, I told you before about the resurrection of Christ and first fruits. Let's look at that real quick. This is going back to the spring feast, but here Paul addresses this. 1520, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, that was through Adam, right? By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign till put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. When it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he's accepted who put all things in subjection under him. So when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. So we, from there, we, we talk, we're talking about going into eternity future. Then, then jump on down. So let's, that is the resurrection. That is this, the feast of first fruits for stuff that I was talking about earlier. So flash forward now to the fall feast. Look at verse 50. I will tell you this, brother. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, we need our glorified bodies because what had to happen to Moses when the Lord himself came down and walked before Moses, what did Moses have to, what had to happen to Moses? He had to be wedged face first into the cleft of a rock as he passed, as the Lord passed by. Moses would be consumed. By the glory of God. And the Lord had his glory turned like all the way down. 0.5. <laughs> and it goes up to a million. So. so flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. The mystery is talking. Paul discloses several mysteries in the New Testament. Here's one right now. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we're not all going to die. The verbiage, that's the language for death um, in biblical times, right? But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. They'll be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So get the picture here. So the, the mystery is resurrection because in the Old Testament, they knew about resurrection. Isaiah he describes resurrection. The mystery isn't that we're going to go to heaven someday. What's the mystery here that he's describing, do you think? 
talk amongst yourselves. Describing a mystery, he says something here is a mystery and he's going to disclose it. What do you think that is? Okay, the mystery, the opinion of many, the mystery is the tying together of a resurrection with the trumpets and also rapture. In other words, it's 1 Corinthians 15 kind of unraveling the mystery that he's described to the Thessalonians. So we've got two rapture things happening here. The rapture, Arpazo is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And then here he's describing in detail how that happens, how our bodies are changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Twinkling of an eye, by the way, is also another one of those Hebrew idioms for Feast of Trumpets and sun going down and get the new moon and so forth. So all these are idioms for that. I think it's fascinating. Let me, let me just look. Do you need to breathe a minute? I, I left you space on the bottom of your paper for notes and things. Are you all good so far? Because I want to look at a passage in Isaiah that we hardly ever look at. If you want to turn with me to Isaiah 26, tell me when, what this is describing here. Let's look at um, let's start with verse 16. Let me, let me back up because this language is going to be in here too. Jesus and talking about the end times and also Paul talking about the end times. You remember this language where um, if you want to, we can go to these. But Paul and Jesus associated a woman in birth, a woman in travail, a woman in birth pangs with our delivery going to, to uh, meet the Lord in his return, right? And he's, he's describing birth pangs. And we know that birth pangs, Jesus in, in the Olivet Discourse, particularly in Matthew 24, talks about all the things happening in the world. We see the things going on like we, we see now uh, in Matthew 24. Also, Luke describes so when you see the fig tree and all the trees, in other words, the fig tree is surrounded by all the trees. Trees are often, each country had its own emblem as a tree. And this language comes up a lot. We can illustrate this in the Old Testament. That's another study, and we're not going to belabor that, spend a lot of time there. But so you got Israel over here, fig tree, and it's surrounded by all the trees. When you see these things, all these things, and you see Israel surrounded by its enemies. There's even a psalm about this. When you see all these things, they look up for your redemption draws near. Um, Jesus is describing these things and uses the birth pangs analogy about how that, you know, you first you start with kind of, oh, I think I felt something. For you guys, you know, your, your wife, your mom, whatever, they felt something. And then over time, though, I see that hand and get with you. Over time, what happens is, is uh, the labor increases as far as the contractions and how close they are together. They get closer and closer and they get more and more intense until there's the delivery. And so Paul said this and Jesus said this. We're going to find the same kind of language really briefly here because the birth pangs, a lot of the birth pangs that are being described is more for Israel. Um, ultimately, their deliverance going to be a really long labor seven years um, or a week or whatever way we can look at it. So Ben, what was your question or comment? Uh, all this revelation stuff is, for example, how uh, Israel has to prepare for one of the signs of the Lord's on the mm -hmm. they're paying attention to that because Israel is enemies, for example, Libya, Sudan, Russia, Persia, which is Iran. Uh, Russia. Well, we know that the times aren't coming yet. Libya is still in some forms of war, so it's not going to 
some of those are, I mean, some of those, they, there are groups living in those areas that are proxy groups, so it's not necessarily the whole country, like Israel being attacked by Lebanon. But we see now, this is an example, we see now Lebanon, Israel's having, for the last few days, they've had about 10,000 or so, I don't know what we're up to now, missiles lobbed at them. Israel did not start going back after Lebanon until they had hit about 8,000 missiles being lobbed. Then Israel decides, okay, we're, we're going to go back to going to go over the border in Lebanon and we're going to start launching some missiles and taking some people out. They didn't do this until after about 8,000 missiles were lobbed from Lebanon. Now the media, now that Israel's striking back, that's mean. Stop. Let's talk about a peace accord. Let's, let's uh, cease fire, cease fire. Well, that's kind of ironic. What was your cease fire call months ago? See, this is, this is going to be the nature of the end times and this is the nature of the world because whether the news media and the politicians know it or not, they're fighting on behalf of the enemy, Satan, because he is the god of this age. And so they are lobbying for him. They're speaking to him, and they don't even realize. It. That's why Israel is so hated by so many. Even a lot of people who call themselves Christians hate the Jews. God's done with Israel, and they don't matter anymore. You know, viva la Palestine, <laughs> right? So my example of the proxies is this, is all of Lebanon enemies with Israel? The answer to that is no, there's a huge mess up. In fact, probably the, only a minority is, and that's Hezbollah. And they're mostly, the, the head's been lopped off Hezbollah. They're trying to create new heads. And they've just, over the last couple of days, all been bombed out at their headquarters. The brilliant move on behalf of Israel, because I don't know if you aware of this. Netanyahu just came here. He wanted to flush out and make sure that Nasrallah, who's been around and murdered hundreds of Americans and Brits and people ever since about 1983 when Hezbollah was founded, they've been trying to lure him out. Israel has taken out, the IDF has taken out a lot of Hezbollah's upper echelon, the founders. But Nasrallah was elusive. They wanted to kind of flush him out. So what's the thing about the cat being away? The cat's away, the, nice will, the mice will play, right? What they did is um, they got word out. Netanyahu got on a plane, very public. Bye, everybody. I'll be back in a few days. I'm going to go get the UN. They had this plan all along. Netanyahu goes. The time Netanyahu, before he hit the podium and showing his, his, his charts and everything about, you know, the, uh, you know, the good and the bad and all this kind of stuff, and he's holding these charts up. Before he got there, he got whispered in his ear before he hit there that, okay, we've confirmed Israel's there at the headquarters we were talking about. And he went in there with an entourage. So when you see this speech and you see Netanyahu giving this speech, Nasrallah is being bombed out. Several bombs, bunker busters in one spot and pile Blast, blast, blast until it get deeper, 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 and they confirm now that he's been taken out. That was a brilliant move because they decided, oh, he's busy over there at the UN now. Get together, guys. Let's make some plans. Boom. Gone. So that is, this, and it's celebration happened right away. You will see people in Lebanon walking around with trays of like little sweets. They're handing out sweets and they're celebrating. They're happy. The Arabs, the Saudis, they're happy. We took that guy out because he was their enemy. So you got Shia versus Sunni type of uh, different factions of um, Islam. One doesn't like the other at all. So they're celebrating. So to your point, we've got we've got this kind of thing going on where when the Bible talks about these places, he's talking about locales where these people came from. But they are, Hezbollah is proxies for who? For Iran and for Russia, turning out now. So Russia is busy sending a bunch of weapons and things to Iran, but also to Hezbollah. Iran, there's a lot of swapping going on. Iran will turn around and give some weapons back to Russia so that they can use them in Ukraine, but Iran is giving weapons to um, Hezbollah and to Hamas. Now, all the tunnel stuff going on, see? So this fulfills. 
scripture where you've got these conditions where they are surrounded by their enemies. And Jesus said this is going to happen is that when Israel and the fig tree is surrounded by all her enemies, you know, look up your redemption's drawing near. These are birth pangs. These are all, all these types of things going on. But we're going to see this, this type of language going on here because this is an example of how we don't know the day or the hour, but we, we know the season. And uh, also to this, as you said, you know, all, all of a sudden this happens. This didn't happen until Israel came back in the land because they were scattered upon the earth, right? Nothing biblical or prophetic was happening for and to Israel, really, other than they're scattered. They're going to be, you know, underfoot, whatever, scattered in all the nations. Nothing happened until 1948. There's no, no Israel, no the land of Israel, no nothing until 1948. Now we're seeing all these things being fulfilled. So you've got this big, massive gap in history. We've got church here, but we're part of one of the mysteries that Paul describes for us, that we've been adopt, adopted in. Romans chapter 11, we are grafted in for a season. And this is God's mercy for the Gentiles. So we've got nothing until 1948. Now all this stuff's kicking off. So that's one of the ways we know that we are in that final, that last generation of all these things happening. We know the season. So back to Isaiah chapter 26. Look at the wording here. Look at verse 16, Isaiah 26, verse 16. We're going to we'll read through this and we're going to unpack some of these phrases because there's some curiosities in here I want you to see. O Lord, in distress they sought you. They poured out a whispered prayer when your discipline was upon them. Like a pregnant woman who rises and cries out in her pangs when she is near giving birth. So the delivery is close by, right? First, they're being disciplined to Israel. They're being disciplined. And then there's this, the birth pangs. That the delivery, they're listening. The birth is coming. The birth is coming. So were we because of you, Lord. We were pregnant. We writhed. But we have given birth to wind. We have accomplished no deliverance in the earth this time. This is also forward looking to make no mistake. And the inhabitants of the world have not fallen. Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust awake and sing for joy. For your due, you have light. And the earth will give birth to the dead. Come, my people. Into your chambers. So he's talking to his people. He says, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed. Wrath of God. Until the fury has passed. For behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of Israel, to punish the inhabitants of Russia, to punish the inhabitants of Iran. This is to punish the inhabitants of the earth. What did we just read? And we looked at it last week. What did we just read in First Thessalonians chapter five, for instance? That wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. That day and that hour, you have no need to be. Don't even worry about it. Well, we have this mystery here that Paul just unpacked that we're not going to be on the earth because we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord together in the air. Here we got the Lord's fury. We also have in Revelation chapter thirty-eight where we've got. When you got the Gog and Magog war, you have that influx of worldly powers coming after Israel. We read about God's wrath, starting verse 17, 18, 19. In my fury, in my great wrath, this kind of stuff. Paul said in the Thessalonians that we're not appointed for that. Where are we going to be? Well, again, come, my people, into your chambers. Set your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed by. For behold... The Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. That's everybody, right? The people, yeah, the, the inhabitants. And the earth will disclose the blood shed on it and will no more cover its slain. Somebody somebody, turn for me, Revelation 3.10, and, be, and re read that for us. Revelation 3.10, similar kind of language. This is the church of Philadelphia. Who's got that? You have similar language where fury upon the earth, that kind of thing. 
Speak up, man. One word. Patient appearance. I'll keep our trial. Okay, pause right there a second. Speak into the church of Philadelphia. Because you've been faithful to my word, you've kept my word. I'm going to keep you. Ariel Eck, I'm going to remove you utterly, completely way out of the way. I'm going to, Kevin, we're sitting right here. You can explain to what Ariel Eck means. Doesn't mean I'm just going to shelter you in place for a while. The chambers in Isaiah that's talking about might have to do with Israel, but it also has another meaning also for us that we meet the Lord in the air, so we're going to be in chambers with the Lord. Wedding bride language going on here, too. It's fascinating. So the Lord is keeping us utterly, completely out of the way that is coming upon the whole world. Go ahead and continue, Ben. Revelation 3.10. I am coming soon, old friends, but you, so that no one may see the crown. So we have the same kind of language here where it's like, there's trouble coming upon the whole world, but I'm going to take you out. Terio Eck. We're just talking about Terio Eck. So I'm going to keep you from this hour of trouble that's coming upon those, those well upon the earth. Not you, you guys on the earth, and you guys are going to shelter in place. I'm going to carry your I'm going to keep you out of that trouble. Because wrath is coming. We're talking about fury. So we have Isaiah 26. We got his fury coming upon the earth. We got that in Revelation 3.10. We have it coming in in First Thessalonians chapter 5. And we've got the Lord saying, um, this is coming on them. This is going to happen to them. But you, see, they're children of darkness. You're children of light. This isn't going to happen to you. This is going to happen to them. But you, but them, but they. So he's making a contrast. Stuff that happens to them versus us. So this, these are examples of rapture that is coming to take God's people out of the earth. Questions so far? Fusion. Anything I can clear up? Is there a rapture? Because we've got, we can get into second coming verses. We know those like from the Old Testament. When he returns, he sets his foot down on the Mount of Olives and it splits in two. Water comes out, fresh and forth. The restoration of the earth starts happening. This is entirely different when we meet the Lord in the air. Turn real quick to look at one more concern. Um, John 14. There's so many verses that I'm we could be getting into that I'm skipping over only because I secretly know that we are going to be getting into these more in the future. But I can look at the first three verses or something like that, John 14. Um, Jesus is telling his disciples, right? He's talking to them. It's toward the end here. He's about ready to promise them the Holy Spirit and tell them their future and what the Lord's going to do, what he's going to do for them. But in, in the first verses, he's saying, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Leaving, and he's going to prepare a place for them. Preparing a place in his Father's house, right? And if I go to prepare a place for you, does he say, I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to come back and I'm going to come down and visit you and stay on the earth forever? He says, I'll come again and will take you to myself. Some people will try to say, well, that's at the end of maybe the kingdom era. Well, that's not the language we have elsewhere. I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way I'm going. The conversation continues. Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? The Lord says, I'm the way. 
this whole discussion comes on because all these mysteries that Paul talked about had not been disclosed yet. So Tom, well, what, how does this work? Or how do, I, how do I unpack this? I don't understand how this works. The church age is one of those mysteries, the age that we're living in right now. So they're kind of confused. They thought Messiah was going to come, deliver them from the Romans and all their oppressors, sit on his throne like David, and boom, here we are. That was his kingdom on the earth. And they thought that was the first coming. They did not see the cross coming. Jesus had to keep telling them over and over, and still they didn't get it for a long time, right? He had to keep repeating himself. They wanted to skip the bad parts because they'd been going through a lot of bad parts. So they were ready for the good part. They just weren't spiritually ready because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, right? What Jesus had just said. So we've got one second coming. Return all the way. Second coming, really, when you think about it in terms of end times events, really kind of starts and is this period that is kicked off by Yom Teruah. And you got your charts kicked off by Yom Teruah, and then we got a season, and it'll be a seven year period, the Day of Atonement or the Days of Awe. And that's the tribulation period. That's for the time for Israel to return and be punished. Because the punishment's coming, like it says here in Isaiah 26. The time of punishment, it's discipline for them. Not eternal damnation, but it's wrath upon the earth. The wrath will be upon the nations that oppressed Israel. There are many promises in the scripture about that. It's going to take out these nations that oppressed his people and his Messiah and so forth. But this is a time of discipline for them. And then we've got, that's the Day of Atonement. And that's a seven-year period. And somewhere in there, We've got tabernacles, tabernacles, dwellings, the Lord coming and dwelling with us. So then we'll have the second coming of Christ, and he will tabernacle with us. He establishes his, his kingdom on the earth. Fascinating, right? There's another aspect of this that I, I want to get into and point to. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that because there's a time to do that, and we'll do that in, in, at a future time. But there are a lot of parallels here with the Hebrew wedding feast because some of the language you see in, in Isaiah 26, for instance, he's standing at the post at the gate. In the Hebrew wedding tradition, what happens is, is like we had in Lord's Supper. What that it, Lord's Supper was emblematic of, you got the, the table and you drink the wine and you do all this kind of stuff. Jesus is making a contract. Remember, he introduced the new covenant. Covenant means a contract, basically, agreement. There's a typology going here where they're very similar. He does this, he makes an agreement with the church. And then he makes a, a, a present, I'm skipping lots, he makes a, a present. We get an engagement ring here in the West. This is a promise. This is a promise. I come back, we're going to have the actual wedding day and the actual wedding ceremony, but until I do, this is it. Back then, there were things like, and even in recent history in the West, there are things like there's a dowry. I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to pay for this and this kind of stuff. I'm going to leave you these gifts. So there might be more than just a ring. So that whole thing looks similar in that Jesus leaves us the Holy Spirit. He says, you know, the Holy Spirit can't come until I leave. So he leaves. Jesus leaves and gives us the Holy Spirit. And this is the promise that he's going to return. And we are sealed. Promise we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, what happens is at that point is they drink, the fathers are involved, the fathers drink on it, you know, hug their kids, pat their kids, the fathers out of their kids. The son now has to go away for roughly a year. And he's got to go to his father's house. They didn't go to rent an apartment in ancient Israel. They didn't always have money to go buy their own land. A lot of times they inherited the land, and the land was huge. It was acres and acres or whatever, but it was the tradition was. Uh, to add to the father's house. So the son goes, and now he's building on the father's house, just as Jesus said, John 14, I want to prepare a place for you. It's a bridal thing. And so the, this is why Thomas is confused. He's going, I don't understand, because you've got a throne, and then you, you're giving me this bridal language stuff. And over here, like he says in Matthew, no one knows the day or the hour, so there's Yom Teruah. I get that. You know, Feast of Trumpets kind of a deal. Use, because there's more mystery going on here. That Paul later on impact, right? But what happens? The son goes away and he, he prepares a place and he says, When I come back, I'm going to bring you to myself. 
in the wedding tradition, that's what he does. He goes away. It's done. The reason why no one knows the day or the hour, not the son or the angels, Jesus is telling him it's just like in the wedding tradition. The son did not know when he was going to be coming back for his bride. You know who got to decide that? The father. The father got to decide when the son was going to go take his bride. The son had to build the place and had to go get his father and say, Dad, come here and check this out. I think I'm done. The father would walk through the place and he had to approve it. He might suggest some changes. And it's like, wow, but are you sure that's good enough? No, no, no. Trust me, you need more cabinet space. Okay, so the son might have to add some, do some things. So meanwhile, they know it's about a year. Bride's side, she, her trousseau is ready. She, her gown is weighed out. She's made herself ready. Her, her gown is white, bleached, and ready, and it's laid out, right? The bridesmaids are ready. They've got oil for the lamps if they've got their act together. Got 10 bridesmaids or virgins. You hope they've got their act together. They don't always. But they've got their oil, they got their lamps. Is this their job now to, to keep an eye out and watch for the procession that's going to come from the son, from the bridegroom? That's what happens. They come and get the bride. The Hebrew wedding tradition. They don't go meet at the chapel to get married. So they don't know exactly when. And on the bridegroom side, they don't know exactly. When. The son didn't know. But he's got his men there, you know, his friends and stuff like that. The, the best man is there, John, John the Baptist. They're there, and they're waiting for word. They're waiting for the word from the Father. Now, let me just say this. When Jesus came the first time, did he know everything as soon as he was born as a baby? Was he a freaky little six-month-old baby walking around talking like an adult? No. He knew things as the Father disclosed things in stages as he came along. He was perfect. And without sin, but as he needed knowledge, as he needed power, he got all things. Jesus said he gets all things from the Father. Jesus at this time, he probably did not know the day or the hour. Probably didn't know, but I guarantee you by the time he was glorified and he ascended, he knew. He knows all things. He knows all things now. But for the language to, to attach to the idiom, idiom, what's going on, he's saying not the son didn't know, only the father knows. So that the, his disciples will go, oh, but that, that's like, you just said Yom Peru, but you're also saying the wedding tradition stuff. Because the father says to son, okay, fine, go get your bride. Now, here's the cool thing that happens. He's like, yes. Then we all get together. Bridegroom's dudes all get together. And they get all kinds of things for noise. They, they'll get a shofar. They'll get things to bang. There'll be lots of shouting. And they'll be blowing up the trumpets. They get together like a person, uh, like a like a parade. It's a big processional. And they like to do it at midnight. That terminology to it, about midnight, about his coming, his return. He used that in the scriptures. So a lot of times that was a thing for fun. It wasn't always at midnight, but in Galilee, it usually was because that was a Galilean tradition. They like to do that. So this procession all, all gathers together and they're going through the streets and people in the villages are all waking up and they're looking at, look, it's it's that, you know, it's that Jesus kid, you know, Joseph's son. Look at, they're going, you know. So they're looking out the window, and they're seeing this processional go by, and sometimes people will join them or whatever, and they come, and this big wedding party comes. But he never goes all the way to the bride's house. Never goes all the way to the bride's house and goes and knocks on the door. He goes as far as the gate. He goes to the gate. At the gate. They meet part way. Her party now meets him, and the two parties merge. The, bride, the virgins, if they've if been paying attention, they hear all the blasts, they hear the shouting, and they go, oh, go, 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 go get her, wake her up. She gets herself, she puts her white dress on, grabs her truce over her, everything she's going to need. He's heading out to the gate. Mom and dad are awake, and they're excited, they're crying, they're hugging. He goes out to the gate. Two parties merge right there, and they go where? They're going back to the bridegroom's father's house for a week long, not a three and a half day long, not a one day long, but for a full seven day celebration. Wedding celebration starts when they all, all the parties, everybody shows up at the father's house, the doors are shut. 
you got the five virgins who missed the boat. And I didn't get oil. You have some of your oil. You had to go get oil. They come back and they're knocking on the door. Still let us in. Let us in. Go, sorry, man. You got to wait a week. You're, you're stuck. You're stuck in the tribulation for a week. You're stuck outside for a week. Sorry. You weren't ready. You didn't have oil. What's the oil? The Holy Spirit. You might have thought you were one of the bridesmaids and you might have thought false believers, right? Thought you were ready. But now, nah, man, you need the oil. You need the Holy Spirit. They didn't have it. Five, five of the ten virgins did not have it. So they're locked outside. So now the wedding party's in there and they have a week-long celebration. And this is where, you know, you'll know me face-to-face. -face, the intimacy of last Christ and our celebration. Now, a lot of people think it mixed up confused. This is a week-long celebration, like a fiesta you'll have. You know, it's a, a, a Mexican celebration. If you're from the Southwest, you're familiar with these. But the marriage supper does not happen until after the end of the week. And let me explain to you how. So this is a celebration. It's a week long. <clears throat> At the end of the week, what ends up happening in is the doors of the father's house are thrown open. The doors are open. This matches up with what happens during the, that is the great trumpet. At the end of Yom Kippur, the, the great trumpet blow. Um, the gates are then opened at the end of that. So there's a beginning and there's an end in this case because it's not all happening in one literal week in the earth. We've got period going on here, of, you know, seven year period. And these, obviously these holidays, these feast days go by every year. But so we're flashing forward here to the week long celebration marriage ceremony and it's the 70th week of Daniel, which we will address more in the future, but we know we've got a week-long period here. The doors are thrown open. Bride and groom are, are introduced. He, there's a lot of people who were invited to the wedding or whatever. Town's folk and brother who heard and came around and they oh, you know, weeks back, let's go. Are you going to go to that marriage supper? Yeah, I'm down, let's go. They know how to cook. And I heard there's going to be some really great wine there. So they show up, they open the door, there's a lot of people there. You're going to have at the end of the tribulation, you're going to have a lot of people who've been saved since then. So these are believers coming in. So these are guests to this wedding at this point. The Old Testament Jews coming now. They survived the tribulation. The doors are open. Then you've got beginning, it's announced, and you, you, know, you can just about hear the clapping and you hear the celebration, you see the celebration. Going on from the angels, beginning, it's a, kind of announced, and there's, they're talking about this um, marriage supper of the Lamb in, in Revelation chapter 19, in anticipation. This is it, guys. We're going to wrap this up. The, the um, bridegroom and his bride, now wife, are coming. This is announced. We see this in Revelation 21, where the angel is showing John. has got John standing up there and, and looking at New Jerusalem up there. And he's, the Lord is, the angel is pointing it and saying, one of the angels holding one of the bowls of wrath, pointing at this saying, behold the bride, now wife, the groom of, of the lamb. And that's how we are introduced, because we, in, in places identified with us, because we as the church indwell in there, bride of Christ. And we return with bridegroom. So we're just, you're disclosed as now the wife. So the doors are open. The veil is thrown back. Oh, well, everybody knows who it is. Bit of fun. And they're announced. Everybody's clapping. Then you've got the marriage supper, and everybody is invited in and who's um, around in attendance celebrates in the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb is going to end up happening after the separation of the goats. Only believers will end up being there. This is happening on the earth before we are inaugurated into the kingdom. So that's the timeline of how some of that happens. But some of the language and things are similarities. The Lord is, is giving us all kinds of types in advance, foreshadows in advance, really, about how he does things. And it's similar to the feast days, similar to the wedding ceremony, similar also to baptism because... In the wedding ceremony, one of the things they do is they'll have a ceremonial washing, um, a ceremonial bathing. Um, 
And uh, that's similar to baptism. There's so many similarities that we can go back, maybe we will in the future, and point to that all are foreshadows of these things. So um, Jesus was dropping all kinds of foreshadows on them about what's going to happen and what it looks like. Did I lose anybody? I know you're not going to remember necessarily all of this. I mean, this is those are some of the key passages to look at and how um, starting from back in Leviticus 23, we weren't even out of the Pentateuch yet, Jesus started foreshadowing all these things he's going to lay out in the future that all point to Messiah and how even the feast days themselves and the Sabbath, all these things look forward for them to, to Messiah. And that's what it means for us as well uh, in a different kind of a context. And it all speaks to, it all sounds like premillennialism to me. No questions? No comments? Did I talk too fast? Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll wrap that up here. We will continue, um, unless the raptures happen this week. We will continue next week. And uh, we'll continue to look at an Old Testament survey of, of prophecies that all point in a specific direction, we believe. Close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for dropping us hints, all the foreshadows. Because we can look back now, we can see what you did. We retrospect, look back and see what you did. It was confusing for people who've been walking with Jesus for years, such as Thomas, because they didn't know all the mysteries. But thank you for folks like Paul who came and unpacked some of those mysteries and tied so many things together for us. And we can look back now at this string of foreshadows and all the scripture you gave us from Genesis to Revelation. And we can appreciate what you did and how you lined things up all to point to Jesus and our time in eternity with you and with your son. Amen.